I, I must apologize for the short notice. Uh, we talked for a long while as to whether it should be face-to-face -face or on Zoom, and eventually COVID won. And so, so I'm extremely grateful to Peter for his forbearance. It would have been great to have had him here in Cardiff, but, uh, you know, this is the heart of Kiddie Botany in Wales. Now, he and I have known each other for a very long time, uh, since he was a PhD student in Reading uh, in, I believe it was the 1970s. And after that, uh, he was persuaded uh, to go to the United States, where he uh, spent 17 years in probably one of the best uh, museums in uh, North America, that is the Field Museum in Chicago. And then in 1999, he returned to Kew as a very young director, but was persuaded to return to China only seven years after that. And first of all, he went back to Chicago, then moved on to Yale, where he was at the dean of the uh, of forestry and um, environmental sciences, and now has a, a, a further post as the president of the Oak Spring Garden Foundation in Northern Virginia. And this supports research and scholarship relating to plant diversity and conservation, and in particular, the impact that plants have on our well being, I think, via uh, gardens and landscape. Um, he's a very prolific uh, writer, very distinguished researcher career. This culminated with his knighthood, a service to horticulture and conservation, and has been, he's been elected to various academies in the UK, in Sweden, and in Germany, uh, not to mention uh, many honorary degrees here, in the, here and in the States. Now, his research, particularly on early uh, flowering plants, is recorded in numerous publications and in two books. Now, one of which does cause me some cause for concern. It was with a chap called Paul Kenrick uh, and was called The Origin and Diversification of Land, a subject is quite close to my heart and which I said, well, sad, sadly for me, I blame him for my really low H factor because writers seem to quote that lovely book uh, rather than me. Uh, and I, it's known for his elegance and um, its insightfulness, which were far beyond me. So. Uh, that's it. We also compete each other in who works on the smallest fossils. And I work on the smallest fossils of land plants. And I think, and I hope we'll see in his talk, the amazingly small fossil flowers that he works on. In both cases, they're charcoalified. Um, now, mine are rather small, simple plants. His are quite beautiful. Uh, well, but for me, actually, small is beautiful. If you're small and simple, I'm good. Um, but uh, I'm sure you'll discover this evening just how magnificent this new source of information is on the um, evolution of the flowering plants. So, Peter, thank you for coming and we look forward to your talk. Thanks so much, Diane. Can you hear me okay? Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to have the opportunity to talk. I wish I was uh, with you in Cardiff. I hope that may be possible one day, but with the constraints of the pandemic, we'll just have to kind of go with what we can do uh, at this strange time. So, uh, you know, during the pandemic, you know, I've been wandering around the 700 acres or so of the Oak Spring Estate taking uh, pictures of, uh, of, uh, of flowers. And I thought I'd just start with a, a few of them just to kind of remind you of this uh, uh, incredible uh, diversity that we enjoy, you know, from peach blossoms to, uh, to uh, apple blossoms, to irises, uh, to peonies, uh, to passion flowers. Um, you know, without flowers, I think our, our world would be a, a very, very different uh, place. And uh, of course, we rely on uh, uh, flowers, um, the, the products of flowers uh, for, for our, our own nutrition. This is our little farm at. Uh, at Oak Spring with the Blue Ridge Mountains uh, in the background. And everything that you see there in that, that basket is a, is a flowering plant. So what I thought I would do today is uh, really split the talk into these five pieces, uh, give you a brief introduction, uh, talk a little bit about what a flower is, then uh, move on to the fossil history of flowering plants and say a little bit about what the earliest flowers were like, and then end by saying, uh, a little bit about where flower, flowers may have come from. So to start with a bit of an introduction, 
So here they are. We all kind of intuitively know what a kind of flower looks like. These are wonderful uh, uh, American lotus growing uh, on the Mississippi uh, River. But uh, flowering plants, the group that has these flowers, they dominate uh, almost all uh, terrestrial uh, ecosystems. And they provide the energy that sustains those terrestrial ecosystems and the biodiversity of which those ecosystems are composed. So this is a lovely slide from Oli Pelma, just illustrating some of the insects. About a third of all insects spend some phase of their life cycle feeding on plants and typically those plants are flowering plants. And if we just kind of look at the major groups of uh, land plants um, and kind of just tot up at the species, what you see immediately is that angiosperms are hugely diverse compared to other groups of, of land plants with some 400,000 plus uh, species and uh, no other group uh, really kind of approaches that, that kind of massive uh, diversity. And uh, as I've mentioned, angiosperms provide indispensable goods and services uh, for us. So if you look at angiosperms and where they kind of sit in the sort of grand picture of, of plant evolution, they're one of five groups of seed plants. And I'll introduce you briefly to the other four groups. So uh, uh, one of the other groups, it's not really a group, it's just one species, ginkgo. Uh, you're probably all familiar with that. Uh, pines, conifer, representative of the conifers, you're probably familiar with, with uh, conifers. And uh, probably many of you are familiar with uh, uh, cycads too. And then there's one final group, the so-called Neetales, uh, that are not so common. This is a, a genus called Ephedra, from which the, uh, from which, uh, pseudofeds and so on take their name. And this strange plant, well, Witcher is another member of that very small group. So flowering plants, one of five major groups of seed plants, the last group of, of those seed plants to appear in the fossil record, the most recent to appear in the fossil record, and by far the most diverse, and also by far the most important for all of us. So what is a flower? Well, again, we all have a kind of general notion of what a flower is. It's kind of, you can see it in this peony. Usually you've got some colored parts around the outside, the petals, then the pollen producing organs towards the inside, the yellow stamens that you see here. And then in the middle, uh, the carpels, and it's inside the carpels that the seeds develop. And you see that same kind of structure. You don't see it quite so well in this gardenia, which is a kind of double gardenia, but you can see the stamens still and uh, uh, the poorly developed carpels uh, in the center. But to really define what a flower is, you need to talk about the individual parts. And actually, uh, it's the aggregation into a flower-like structure is, is much less important and much less difficult from a developmental point of view or from an explanatory point of view than explaining where the individual pieces come from. And that's the kind of key question. So let's look in a bit more detail at these individual pieces. So one of the pieces that I mentioned already is the stamens, and they're very characteristic in flowering plants. And they, they come in all shapes and sizes. Here's what the peculiar swollen, bright, orangey, yellow stamens of a genus called Sarcandra. Uh, here are the stamens uh, uh, in a camellia. Here are the incredibly proliferated stamens in a New Zealand member of the family Myrtaceae. And what's characteristic about angiosperm stamens is that they have four pollen sacs and the pollen sacs are arranged in two pairs. So if you do a cross section, that's what they kind of look like. So then there's the carpal, the structure that encloses the ovule and the seed and that matures into uh, the fruit. So you can see them here uh, in the center of the flower. This is a, a rose. You can see the stamens are out the outside. You can see the carpels in the center. Uh, you can see them just about in this peach flower. There's the stigma, one of the stigmas here, the rest of the stamens, there's the stigma again. So uh, if, if you look around, you'll see that there is uh, a carpel in the middle of these flowers and it's those that develop into the peach. This is just taken outside the room that I'm speaking to you now. So the peach then is a fruit. And as you know, it's got a hard pit on the inside and then inside that hard pit, just like uh, an almond is the meat, 
which is the actual C. And then there's a kind of technical issue which is quite important and that the, the ovule inside most angiosperm uh, flowering plant uh, fruits, carpels, uh, have these two uh, coverings. So when you look at a diversity of angiosperm fruits and seeds, this is just a selection uh, from the legumes, um, all of the little seeds that you see here develop from an, uh, an ovule that has two coverings, two uh, integuments around the outside. And very characteristically, those ovules are typically uh, reflexed, and you can see the two integuments around the outside, and then in the center uh, is the embryo sac with the egg cell, which when fertilized develops into the embryo and a new young plant. So really, uh, figuring out where flowers came from, these basic structures, the stamen, the carpels of the ovary, uh, and the ovules which develop into the seeds are the kind of key pieces. So people have known about this extraordinary diversity of flowers and been thinking about this extraordinary diversity of flowers for hundreds of years, uh, obviously. And two kind of main ideas sort of arose uh, when uh, Diane and I were students. One was that the kind of basic flower might be something like a magnolia with its, with its white petals or sepals and its stamens and then the little green carpels in the center. Or alternatively, the simplest flowers might be the ones that are the most basic in flowers. So this is a Turkish hazel, uh, one of the catkins showing the male flowers and the male flowers there, the pollen flowers are extremely small, extremely reduced and put together in these long catkins. So those were kind of two of the prevailing ideas uh, when some of us were students and that picture's changed quite dramatically now. And we'll talk about that uh, in the course of the lecture. So uh, just to give you an idea of one of the groups now that we look to for uh, some of the, some examples perhaps of what the earliest flowers might have looked like, uh, we look to the water lilies, which include the giant, uh, sometimes called Queen Victoria's water lily, Victoria uh, Amazonica, with its huge flowers with lots of parts and kind of complicated uh, biology or just a more normal regular water lily that you see here in the genus Nymphaea. But also within that group, you have these curious, uh, perhaps wind pollinated flowers uh, of Brazenia. You have these tiny little flowers with six stamens of cabomba, and you have this bizarre thing called Trithuria, where it's quite difficult to find out actually what is the flower, but it does have those typical characteristic stamens and typical uh, carpal with a uh, very reduced ovule inside. So there's the point I'm making is there's a lot of variation uh, in floral structure and even among the groups that we think are particularly relevant to early flowering plant evolution, there's a lot of variation. And this of course is what one of the many topics that Darwin was interested in and he uh, wrote three books trying to think about the origin of the diversity and complexity of, of flowers. So what does the fossil record tell us about the history of flowering plants? Well, there's this kind of classic quote between uh, Darwin and uh, Joseph Dalton Hooker, who was the second director of Kew, one of my predecessors. Darwin wrote the rapid development as far as we can judge of all the higher plants by which he meant angiosperms within recent geological times is an abominable mystery. And that quote has been used very often to the point that it's almost become a kind of cliche. Darwin, of course, was kind of on top of the latest ideas of the day and uh, people were describing fossil plants from about a hundred million years ago. And it was becoming clearer that uh, once you go back beyond about 100 million years, you don't see many flowering plants, as judged at least by their leaves, which is what people were studying uh, at that point. And once you're after about 100 million years ago, flowers, flowering plants, as judged by their leaves, seem to be pretty much uh, everywhere. So this is a bit of a puzzle uh, for Darwin. So just to kind of illustrate that, this is a, a, an old diagram from a paper written, you know, too long ago to remember. And it's just a kind of graphical summary of the kind of incoming of flowering plants 
and the decline of other groups. I could talk more about the details on which this is based. It's a pretty crude picture, but it makes the central point. 100 million years is right around the middle of this graph, right around where angiosperms take off and these other groups uh, decline in relative terms. So what that means then is that you have this period here, which runs from, uh, let's say, 60 or 70 million years here back to 100 million years, which corresponds to uh, the later part of the age of dinosaurs. So this uh, wonderful illustration from the famous uh, Zallinger mural, uh, the Peabody Museum at Yale, sort of makes this point. So you have T-Rex and Triceratops out in vegetation that looks very similar to the vegetation of today. And you've got a kind of magnolia here, you have a ginkgo in the back, you have something that looks like a rhododendron here, maybe a palm uh, in the front. So this period from about 100 million years to 65 million years ago, uh, you had these very strange, unfamiliar animals, but with rather increasingly familiar uh, plants. So I'm going to use this kind of time scale as the kind of orienting uh, motif, if you like, for the rest of the talk. And uh, it's really, this is really the Cretaceous period, the period of geological time that's most relevant, which starts about 145 million years ago and ends with the demise of the dinosaurs, so-called asteroid impact, 65 million years ago. And here's that 100 million year datum that we've been talking about uh, already. And just to kind of put it in perspective for you, I'm just going to mention briefly, I'm not a dinosaur guy, but I'll mention briefly uh, three dinosaurs that help kind of put this time period in perspective. So this is um, the two, this is actually named Apatosaurus, very similar to Brontosaurus, comes from the Morrison formation in the latest Jurassic, just before the beginning uh, of the Cretaceous uh, period. So typical long neck sauropod, a dinosaur. Here's uh, the picture of, uh, of uh, Brachiosaurus, Brontosaurus rather, at the, uh, at the Peabody Museum at Yale, where they're just taking it down to do a new mount of it. Then another Yale-related dinosaur that I want to mention is Deinonychus, and this is John Ostrom. And he described uh, this very different dinosaur from about 115 million years ago from Wyoming in the Cloverly formation, a very active, he proposed it as an active dinosaur. And it's really from John Ostrom's ideas that our kind of current concept of dinosaur park type dinosaurs really derives. So Deinonychus is from about 115 million years ago. And then there's this one that I've been associated with. This is a T-Rex. This comes from the Hell Creek Formation about 65 million years ago, just about at the very end of the dinosaur era. So just to kind of go back to our datum, this is kind of where those uh, three dinosaurs fit in. And we're gonna be talking about uh, fossil plants from this uh, uh, period of the Cretaceous. So fossil history of flowering plants. Well, when I was a student, we did know about some uh, fossil plants. Um, one of the places that we knew about fossil plants was from the Baltic amber. This is from the amber that you gather around the shores of the Baltic from Northern Germany and, uh, uh, and Denmark. And some of those ancient resins, which are you know, on the order of 50 million years or so uh, old, have little flowers in addition to insects preserved in them. And at a, at the time I was a student in the 70s, David Dilcher at Indiana University was also starting to get interested in Eocene fossil flowers, collecting them from the clay pits uh, in uh, Kentucky and uh, Tennessee. And here you can see a, a specimen squashed on the rock, of what's actually an early uh, legume. So those fossils are from uh, Western Ken uh, Kentucky and Tennessee that you can see there. And I went to Dilcher's lab uh, in uh, 19... Uh, when was it, 78, uh, uh, I guess, um, or, yeah, or it's no, 81, <laughs> time flies. And I worked on uh, some Cretaceous flowers that David had collected from that new locality uh, in Russell County, uh, Kansas, that you see. Uh, these fossils were preserved, kind of squashed on the rock, 
they had quite a lot of information uh, 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 to give up. And uh, we were able to reconstruct that particular one as very much like, and I think pretty reliably, very much like a modern magnolia. We could compare it point to point, the leaves, the bud scales, the inner and outer petals, uh, the scars on the receptacle. Uh, we could compare it point for point with a modern tulip tree or magnolia. They're very closely uh, uh, related. But more interesting and perhaps more important was a description that uh, kind of was forgotten a little bit in 1977 from fossils collected on Martha's Vineyard, uh, which you see up here in Northeastern North America. These were described by Bruce Tiffany in a paper uh, in um, 1977 uh, from uh, sediments um, from this part of uh, Martha's Vineyard and from sediments that kind of look like this, this kind of uh, 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 browny colored sediments. And those were kind of sieved out. Bruce was used to working on fossil fruits and seeds. And so he uh, sieved out these sediments and out came these flowers and that he reported it uh, in nature. But that was kind of forgotten. And actually at about the same time, uh, uh, a colleague of mine, Elson Marie Fries, uh, who had also been working on fossil fruits and seeds, had collected some Cretaceous material from Osen in southern Sweden here from this pit. And uh, just like uh, the material from Martha's Vineyard, kind of unconsolidated, blackish, grayish, brownish uh, sediments, uh, here's Elsa Marie, she was able to sieve out an extraordinary diversity of flowers. And this was really quite surprising. These are from about 75 million years ago, about the same age as the ones that Bruce had described from Martha's Vineyard. And uh, these flowers, as Diane alluded to in the introduction, were exquisitely preserved in an unusual way. They were charcoalified and they were tiny. They were on the order of two or three millimeters uh, at all, but beautifully preserved with all of the floral parts uh, still uh, present. So this is kind of where these fit in our scheme. This is the Osun material and the Kansas material, Kansas material a little older, uh, just before about uh, just uh, a little under 100 million years. This material was small. Uh, the way it was uh, studied uh, was using scanning electron microscopy. And Elsa Marie, based on the material from uh, Osen, uh, in several classic papers, described uh, these early fossil flowers and was able to relate them to modern flowering plants. And there weren't just a few of them. And there weren't just a few types. There were a lot of them, very abundant, and there were many different uh, types. Many of them still to be described, beautifully preserved, and capable of direct comparison uh, with the flowers of living flowering plants. The importance of this discovery was that one was able now to compare fossil flowers with the flowers of their living relatives. And because much of the classification of living flowering plants is based on flowers. Uh, that's very important for placing the fossils in the context of living plants. The second thing was, if you have the flowers, then you probably have the stamens. If you have the stamens, then there's a good chance that you'll be able to get the pollen in situ. And if you can identify the pollen grains from the flowers, then you can start to interpret the pollen grains that we find dispersed in the sediment. And then third, the flowers give you a kind of indirect insight into what the pollination and dispersal of these ancient plants may have been like. Now, in the early days, um, uh, the way that one could study the, these flowers but was either to use scanning electron microscopy, which allowed you to look at them from the outside, or if you were really dedicated and interested, for some particular reason, you could embed them in plastic and section them in a kind of uh, uh, typical classical anatomy kind of a way. And indeed, Elsa Marie and some of us did that. Um, but now we have a kind of new technique, and this is a, a little flower that we've just published, uh, actually from sediments in Portugal around about the same age as those from Osun. But here and now we have the opportunity to study them using 
uh, advanced CT uh, technology. So we've actually used these advanced photon sources in the States, in Japan, um, but particularly uh, Elsa-Marie has used this one, uh, a Swiss light source in Villigan, not so far uh, from Zurich. And the information that this gives you, so here's an SEM, but here is what you can do uh, using these, these high resolution scans. So these are virtual sections, CT scans, just the same as CT scans if you went to the hospital, of a longitudinal section, a transverse section, through those flowers that I just showed you. And you can see the tiny little details on the inside of the flower, which allow us to kind of figure out what these plants are related to. This particular one uh, is a member of a group that's very common around about uh, in the late Cretaceous. That group includes rhododendrons and heathers and so on, uh, but it also includes the primrose family. And this we can place pretty precisely uh, in the primrose family. So just to give you a, an example, this is another uh, ericalian flower, a thing called glandular calyx. Uh, this one from uh, Georgia, you can see it rotating around here. It's a little bud, the buds, the petals are all folded up. And if we go to the next slide, which is the same bud, now you see in these sections, you can see the petals gradually unfurling as the sections go down. And then you'll start to see the three styles emerging from uh, the tip of the flower. And then as they go down into the ovary, you start to see the stamens uh, of the flower. Uh, you can see them there. Now down in the center into the ovary, three oculed ovary with the ovules born on the uh, placenta. So these new techniques, these new imaging techniques, just as they've revolutionized medicine over the last several decades, uh, they've also revolutionized the study of this uh, fossil material. So um, we have uh, uh, been exploring for many of these uh, lo new localities with these fossil flowers. And uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, uh, the kind of next phase in the evolution of this work. So having uh, identified that uh, late Cretaceous flowers are pretty abundant, not only at Osun, but Martha's Vineyard, localities in Portugal, localities in Georgia, localities in Japan, localities in Kazakhstan. Uh, the next question was, could we go back earlier? Could we go back into the early Cretaceous and start to look at some flowers from the earlier phase of angiosperm evolution? before angiosperms really started to become super common and dominant. So we went to uh, look at localities uh, in Eastern North America, uh, in Portugal, uh, and in uh, Southern England. So in 1976, there were two classic books that came out that were very inspirational as a student. And in one of those books uh, was this diagram. This is from the Potomac group in Eastern North America, and it shows two sort of main phases of early angiosperm evolution, a kind of very early phase with relatively few, not very diverse leaves, and then a later phase with more diverse leaves and more diverse uh, pollen grains. So uh, in uh, the uh, late 1980s, 1988, we went down to the Potomac group, we discovered some new localities, we found this same kind of sediments, these soft unconsolidated sediments with lots of little plant-like tea leaves uh, preserved in them. Uh, and these turned out to be uh, uh, very, very productive for early flowers. So this is a shot from 1988 showing Elsa Marie uh, bagging up some of our samples that we collected from the Potomac group. We did a bit of processing in the field. And indeed we found lots and lots of flowers, just hundreds, this one is hundreds of stamens of a plant that has uh, distinct kind of pollen, and that we were able to relate to the modern boxwood family. Here's another one that we described. This is uh, closely related to the avocado, bay leaf, cinnamon family, the Lauraceae. Uh, very complicated structure, but um, a little sort of bilobed flap with uh, five flowers, all beautifully preserved. 
So then the following year, in 88, we been in the Potomac group, following year in 89, we decided to go to Portugal because the in Portugal a little bit older, um, but equally uh, interesting from the standpoint of this kind of material. And lo and behold, we found those same kinds of sediments. This is a locality called Torres Vedras, now covered by a kind of shopping center, uh, perhaps an old quarry that had been cliff for uh, development. Here is another locality, one called Catafica. Uh, here am I trying to collect a few samples. This was a road cut, the Catafica. Other localities were in the clay pits that uh, the Portuguese were uh, mining for the ceramic uh, clays that they were uh, using. And uh, so here are the localities scattered through the central part of, uh, of Portugal. And here are some of the, the, the fossils we uh, obtained. Uh, small seeds, uh, small stamens, and some of these uh, were beautifully preserved. So these are some seeds from uh, those Portuguese uh, localities and using the CT scanning, you can see that we were actually even able to identify the embryos. Here's a close up of one of the embryos inside these tiny little seeds. So here's a, an example. So uh, we're actually still working uh, on the material from the Potomac group. And Portugal, we're in the middle of uh, actually writing a large paper on the Catafica locality. But in the process of this work, um, between, let's say, the late 1980s and the early 2000s, uh, we were kind of bystanders to a uh, a real revolution that occurred in understanding plant evolution. And that was to uh, find uh, how all of the different groups of living flowering plants are interrelated. This is a sketch of Darwin's in which he was beginning to think about this idea, how different groups of living organisms mated. This is from uh, Haeckel, the uh, uh, about a hundred, more than a hundred years ago, almost 140 years ago. Um, but we were no way of getting after this until the kind of molecular revolution uh, came along. And over the last 20 years, people have been madly sampling those 400,000 or so living flowering plants and now have a kind of family tree that puts them all together and places them all in context. I won't go into the details of this. Obviously, that's, this represents a huge amount of work by a very large number of researchers from all over the world, but the pattern is increasingly clear. And uh, just to kind of simplify it, what we basically have is two major groups, the monocots, which count for about 22% of living angiosperm species, and the so-called eucots, which account for about three quarters of all living angiosperm species. And then there are some that are kind of left over that we call the magnoliid uh, dicots, and they're altogether only about 3% uh, of the total. So about three quarters of all angiosperms are eudicots. They're diagnosed by a particular feature of their pollen grains, these so-called tricolpate pollen grains form in little tetrahedral uh, tetrad. So the two most diverse lineages are the eudicots that include, you know, everything from sunflowers to potatoes, to passion fruits, to peonies, to chicory, whole range of different legumes, many, many, many different roses, uh, and the monocots, which include palms, grasses, irises, lilies, uh, uh, that, those kinds of, of plants. So they're the two big groups. But if we look at detailed uh, molecular trees, we can set aside the eudicots and the monocots. And we're looking now at the very base of the angiosperm tree. And we have one little group, the so-called magnoliates or eumagnoliates. What do they include? Well, they include the magnolias, which we've talked about already and which we know 
were around quite early in angiosperm evolution. They include uh, a family called the Ananaceae, it's a Swiss family. This is the one that happens to grow here on the estate. Uh, it includes um, uh, Lauraceae, spice bush that I mentioned already, Calianthaceae, uh, and uh, Piperaceae. So there's a group here down near the base of flowering plants that includes these um, living groups. Uh, then there's a kind of setting aside the magnolias, there are still some further down still at the base here, and they include things that are pretty obscure, except for the water lilies that you'll probably be aware of. So the Nephiates can fit in here. The one at the very base there is a strange plant from New Caledonia, endemic to New Caledonia, just one species. Uh, and there are really not many species in this group uh, as a whole, really very, very few, very much a relictual group. But it includes things like Amborella that I've mentioned, the water lilies that I've mentioned, and also this strange thing that I showed earlier in the Chloranthaceae. Chloranthaceae have four uh, living genera. So if we look at some of those Portuguese uh, localities and ask ourselves what's in it, like that Catafica rope cut that I showed you that we're working on at the moment, in terms of numbers of specimens and numbers of species, Chloranthaceae pretty pretty prominent whether you take all samples or whether you take just one of the samples the magnolias are also pretty prominent here what's not prominent not very prominent are the eudicots and of course there are some that we can't be absolutely certain but where we get a hint of relationships they turn out not to be eudicots but they turn out to be one of these other groups and these other non-eudicots non are uh, are um, uh, also, not these diverse eudicots. So here are a couple of the chloranthaceae. They have these curious little inflorescences, typical angiosperm stamens, uh, but the flower just seems to consist of one stamen, no bract. Sometimes it looks like it might consist of two stamens, no bract, no perianth parts, no carpels, and then uh, the little fruits that uh, uh, are related to uh, chloranthaceae. Here's some pictures of them. Here's the little stamen uh, inflorescences and the fruits of hediflora, and then other kinds of flowers. This one might be a, a monocot, nine stamens, three carpels. This one might be piperales or perhaps uh, uh, chloranthaceae, a little fruit with little hooks on it. Here's another one. This one probably magnoliales. These are all from the Taurus Vedras, which at the moment is the oldest flora we have that contains these angiosperm flowers. So if you look at Taurus Vedras and ask, you know, what are, how are angiosperms represented in those samples? You can see that angiosperms have quite a lot of species compared to other groups, but not so common in terms of the number of specimens. Other plants, spore-bearing plants, ferns and so on, conifers, uh, are more common in terms of the numbers of specimens. And if you want to get a handle on how important were the eudicots, you can look at the pollen grains. And what you find there is that Taurus vedras eudicots account for about 7% of the different kinds of pollen grains, the catafica about 14%. If you went out into the local vegetation uh, around the world today, those percentages would be much, much higher. One group that I haven't talked about is the monocots, and they're a little bit elusive at this early stage, but we, have some, we had some pollen grains that uh, we thought were related to the modern Araceae, and that's now been kind of confirmed by the uh, discovery of other aeroid-like fossils. So what would they have looked like? They're, these plants would have looked something like this, a bit like the jack in the pulpit that's native to uh, the British uh, uh, Isles. So uh, here we are, Portugal, some of the earliest flowers that we can find in Tor Torres Vedras here. As you move up, you get a more diversity in the Potomac group. And by the time you get into here, you've got a lot of diversity. 
of flowering plants. Well, what about further back? Well, further back, uh, actually deposits in Southern England give us some of our best uh, insights. These that Wealden, that outcrops on the Southern half of the Isle of Wight, uh, also around Hastings and further along the coast uh, out towards uh, Lulworth Cove. So Norman Hughes, uh, back uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s and 90s, worked hard on trying to figure out the stratigraphy of the Wealden, along with many other uh, geologists and paleontologists, and he was particularly interested in the pollen grains. And compiling Norman's data, you have this phase of the early Cretaceous, ranging from the Alter Rivian through to the uh, Aptian, and the pattern is pretty clear. So our earliest localities with flowers, such as Taurus Vedras, are from about here. They have a few triculpate pollen grains indicating eudicots, but there is an earlier record, and that earlier record is comprised, at the moment anyway, solely of pollen grains, no eudicots, very rare, and by the time you get back into the the uh, uh, middle Horta Rivian, or a little bit further back into the Valanginian, and just burn pollen is extremely rare. So that by the time you get to the very earliest part of the Cretaceous, no angiosperms. So where are we? We've kind of, if you pull all this together, which we tried to do in this book that came out uh, about a decade ago now, um, the pattern that we get from looking at the fossils and the pattern that we get from looking at the molecular data and what that says about the relative time of appearance of angiosperm groups in the fossil record, it all fits pretty well, which gives us some confidence that we're getting a grip on reality uh, here. Lots of details still to argue about, and uh, I think a lot more thinking uh, to be done, uh, particularly around the, the molecular data and a lot more fossil discovery to be done around the paleobotanical uh, data. But overall, the picture is pretty consistent. So by the time you get into the earliest Cretaceous, you know, we've been talking about the diversification through this interval, but the very earliest in the Bariasian, and even down in the base of the Valanginian, we have no evidence of angiosperms based on anything, based on pollen grains, leaves, anything. So we have a kind of pretty coherent picture, but it leaves us with this last and rather tricky question of where did flowers come from, which really, as I mentioned, boils down to how can you explain the origin of that very characteristic stamen? And how can you explain the origin of the carpal with its ovule inside with these two coverings? Well, um, we decided that we would uh, go to look for some of this material uh, in Asia and uh, really following in the footsteps of, of Roy uh, Chapman Andrews, who, who you could think of as the original Indiana Jones, who led these American museum expeditions to Mongolia uh, in the twenties and you know, really kind of pioneered the discovery of uh, dinosaurs, particularly dinosaur eggs uh, in Mongolia. And since then, there've been others from the American Museum, like my friends, Mike Novacek and, and Mark Norell, who don't look quite the same as Roy Chapman Andrews, also been collecting, working with Mongolian colleagues, collecting dinosaurs in Mongolia. Some of those dinosaurs are a little older than this uh, Cretaceous, some of them are Cretaceous age dinosaurs. So we decided that we would try to look for uh, early angiosperms uh, in first in Mongolia, and then later, as we'll talk about uh, in uh, Inner Mongolia, uh, on the other side of the border uh, in China. These deposits date from uh, perhaps even a little bit later than this that I show in this diagram there, they're probably around about 125 or even uh, a little bit uh, younger. And we thought we might find uh, uh, some early angiosperms and we found no early angiosperms. Uh, so uh, we uh, 
uh, however, did find a lot of other interesting things. Now, Mongolia is a different kettle of fish altogether than doing field work in Portugal or uh, North America. It's pretty bleak out there, not a lot of water. And uh, uh, some of the localities are in coal mines, like this one at Shivayubu, and they yield these kinds of uh, fossils, very different from the fossils that we're really uh, after. Uh, this is another locality, Shinkaduk, uh, where we're collecting from these little outcrops here. There's a camp, see it's pretty bleak out there. Some typical ginkgo type leaves, no flowering plants so far. But the best locality, or at least the most informative locality for us is this one, Teshingovi. It's a lignite mine uh, in Mongolia that we uh, first visited uh, I was just checking today, we first, first visited it back in, uh, I think, 2011, so over a decade ago. Here, the fossils are beautifully preserved. You can see they kind of look like a sort of recent compost heap. The material is just physically uh, readily removable from, 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 the, from the rock, and, and you can pull out whole cones uh, that, that look like this, and among them, no angiosperms, but lots of conifers. Some conifers that look a lot like modern conifers, other conifers that are kind of weird and uh, 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 that are uh, related to perhaps other groups, not even conifers uh, at all. But some of them are incredibly, uh, I'm having a little trouble stopping that. Some of them are incredibly uh, like uh, modern conifers. Among them are these uh, leaves, you know, three different kinds of these sort of strap shaped leaves. And we've been trying to figure out which plants these leaves belong to. One of them belongs to this thing, uh, Crasilovia uh, mongolica, which is perhaps a strange conifer or perhaps something else. Others belong to this peculiar plant, a thing called Umalta lepis, where we have these strange capsules with seeds inside them. And then others are these things, uh, which are little um, seed bearing structures where that are paired and have one seed inside, three different kinds. So what they look like. And this is a reconstruction of one of the cones. Fascinating plants, which I could give a whole lecture about, but we'll keep moving. So we had those those are fossils that we had described from Tevshingovi uh, here in Mongolia. When we started to do field work in Inner Mongolia in China, we hoped we might find uh, similar material. And we traveled out to uh, Jared Banner. This is a uh, Google Earth um, shot of Jared Banner. And you can see immediately there are huge coal mines around this town. And that's where we were. Uh, hoping to look for angiosperms. So we did expeditions in 2017, and I went back again in 2019. And uh, to our great delight, we found nothing that was preserved in the same way as Tevshingovi, but instead we found this wonderful silicified deposit in which uh, the plants had been literally uh, petrified. And when that material is sectioned, you can see a whole range of things. So you see bits of stem here, bits of wood, these peculiar structures that I'll talk more about in a moment. This is the cross section through a, the stem of a club moss. This is a cross section through a fern rachis. This is a cross section through a pine needle, piece of wood, short shoot, uh, and so on. But particularly interesting were these fossils, and uh, you can see what the chert is like. It's kind of sharp, flint-like uh, material. And it has these beautiful little cones with these recurved structures on them. They live, give lots of beautiful information. They each have two seeds uh, inside, as opposed to the Mongolia ones, which always have one seed uh, inside. And using the CT, we can pull this out and you can see the structure here. So the bract is green and they're kind of recurved copules, 
and you can see one seed inside the other seed having been uh, lost. Lots of detail to talk about uh, in these fossils, but I'd just like to show you a kind of CT uh, movie through one of these uh, structures. Uh, that was, uh, let's see if we can get that to work. So here we see the CT structure. You can see the two seeds, you can see the stalk, you can see the bract, and then these coverings that enclose the two seeds. So you have this kind of four angled thing with a pair of seeds inside. Beautifully uh, preserved. Now here a longitudinal section and you can see the bract, you can see the recurve structure and then here is the seed inside and we'll go through it in longitudinal section you'll see another seed come into focus. There's the bract. Here's one seed attached up here. There goes one seed. Here comes another one. Also attached out here. So what's the significance of this? Well, we were disappointed not to find uh, any uh, flowering plants. But what we did find were these cupules. This is a little diagram of this one, the one that I just described from Inner Mongolia. These are the, th the three that we had from Mongolia itself. And then these are others described from elsewhere in the fossil record. The significance of this is that people have suggested that these recurved structures with a seed inside actually could be the outer layer of the angiosperm two-layered integument. And so while we haven't tracked down the origin of flowering plants or any flowering plants themselves, we are starting to get clues that all of these copulate structures may be basically the same, sometimes with a lot of seeds, sometimes with one seed, sometimes with a couple of seeds, sometimes elaborated, sometimes very simple, but the copule itself could correspond to this outer layer of the angiosperm ovule. If that's true, then we've started to zero in on some of the groups that are relevant to uh, figuring out the origin of flowering plants, but we still have some things to explain, lots of things to explain. Uh, we have to explain where the leaves come from, and we have to explain where this other layer, the uh, carpal, the thing that actually makes the fruit, that actually makes the ovary, where that came from too. So that's where we're at. Uh, with the research. We hope the material from Inner Mongolia, this beautiful permineralized material, will help give us some answers. But that's kind of where we are uh, in our current understanding. So I think I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing there. You can check us out on uh, the web at osgf.org, sign up for our newsletter, uh, or um, just be content with what you've heard today. Thank you very much. So um, thank you very much, Peter. I'm going to hand over to uh, Diane in just a moment. But I, I do, while John's on screen, I just want to thank him for all the uh, communications and efforts he's put to. I know that Peter appreciates that, that very much. he's put into making this happen. It's, it's uh, unusual for us to do it and having John helping us has been extremely good. A pleasure. So, um, we've opened the chat now. And um, uh, thank you, my room is marvellous. Yeah, it's my room, but it's Diane's reprint collection, <laughs> I should say. Um, yeah, so Diane, do you want to uh, <coughs> put questions in? Am I, am I on mute or? Uh, oh, no, no, we're, 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 we are, we're, yes. we're being. I should add, um, say that uh, I live next door to Chris. And my room is probably less tidy than his. But, uh, anyway, uh, I, I, there's an awful lot of uh, talk about mutates when it comes to um, angios and um, possible sister groups or what have you. Um, how, how, what do you stand on, on those? Are you with the? Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. And um, 
uh, uh, definitely have a view on it. Um, the, uh, one of the things that we found as we've explored for angiosperms, not only in Mongolia and Inner Mongolia, but also in Eastern North America and Portugal, these early floras, are lots of seeds that are clearly not angiosperms and that appear to be related to Neetales. And I, I mean, very abundant and extremely diverse. And uh, so they were clearly in the same habitats that these early flowering plants were, were in. And uh, some of them look uh, quite ephedra-like, uh, others of them look more like Wawichia. Um, there's obviously a variety of them. Um, where exactly they, how exactly they relate to flowering plants, I think is still uh, uncertain. Um, but I think uh, at least uh, I'm quite very convinced that they are, uh, has, as others have suggested in the past, and I think we have better evidence now, um, that they're related to these um, uh, cycadioideas and benititales that you see so often in dinosaur reconstructions, the things that look like little cycads, Christmas pudding shaped things with leaves coming out of the top. I think there's good evidence that neetales and benititales are, are um, uh, closely related. They were important in these environments. They were diversifying at the same time as flowering plants. Whether they're closely related or not is another question. And I think we're, the jury is, is still out uh, on that. And it will require figuring out the homologies of all of these different organs, which I think we've been very slow at being able to do. So finally, for me, um, when I was first a PhD student, I had a room that had been inhabited by a chap called Hansel Thomas. Yes. He worked a lot on uh, these fossils, and some of those that you're showing now are, are rather similar to the ones that he was describing. Absolutely. And uh, I think Hansel Thomas, I mean, we've both been associated with these people from the past. You with uh, Hansel Thomas and me with Harris. And Hamshaw Thomas described uh, material from South Africa, from the Triassic, very similar to what we have uh, in Mongolia and Inner Mongolia. And he also, of course, described Catonia from, from Yorkshire. Harris then showed that, and he thought Catonia, as you know, was a flowering plant. Harris then showed that it wasn't a flowering plant. And so everybody lost interest in, in Catonia. But actually, I think Catonia is kind of coming back into uh, focus as a very interesting uh, plant that's very relevant to this discussion. And the paper that we had uh, in Nature just a few weeks ago, or whenever it was, um, puts forward the view that all of these strange recurved copule things are basically the same. And uh, so Catonia is just one that has a lot of seeds, and the ones we've got from, from uh, uh, Mongolia and Inner Mongolia are ones that have a few seeds. Um, but they're all basically the same, and I think very relevant to this whole flowering plant question. I think, is it that Genselmore has a very similar question? I'm going to hand over to you, Will, for the technology. Uh, oh, if Pat's yes. question is crossed to the minute. Yes, so Pat says, I find the chorister sperm fossils interesting. It looks like those fossils will clarify their organization, but is this simply convergence? Um, well, of course, uh, uh, there are some people who have argued that it's convergence. Um, I personally uh, don't think so. I think if you look at them carefully, the structure of the copule is exactly the same. Obviously, these plants uh, in the Triassic had very different leaves from the plants in the, uh, in the early Cretaceous. So there is no question that these were different kinds of plants. The real question, though, is are the copules homologous? And... Uh, I think you can demonstrate pretty clearly that they are, and um, uh, I'm sure that that will be a vigorous debate in the future. Brilliant. So we've got two questions from Margaret here. Do you think the variety of flowers is because they were originally windborne, so they led to all sorts of genetic variations? Um, I, I think... Um, the, uh, in the early phases of flowering plant evolution, I think we had both wind and insect pollinated uh, plants. And I think, you know, I think it's very likely that 
that Hediosmum and some of the Chloranthaceae were wind pollinated, but some of them also could have been insect pollinated and other flowers, I think pretty clearly, much more likely to be uh, insect pollinated. So I think that there was probably a diversity of, of um, these plants um, early in, in flowering plant uh, evolution. And uh, I think what you see is a group of, of plants with flowers that are very um, flexible in the way that they can be put together. Sometimes they're extremely simple, sometimes they're bigger and more complex with a lot of organs, but they had not yet zeroed in on a kind of solid bow plan. As you move up into, as you move up into um, eudicots, then flowers become more constrained as Peter Andrus has pointed out. And so then you've got typically fives, but also other numbers, and uh, you don't get as much uh, uh, a variation. So I think these early flowers were very variable in their in their construction, and I'm sure that reflects sort of variable pollination mechanisms too. Okay, so there's a good follow-on question from that. Is the explosion of angiosperm species associated with an explosion in insect pollinators? Um, I think uh, uh, you certainly have through the late Cretaceous some of the more important insect pollinating groups diversifying. Um, the derived Hymenoptera, the, uh, the Lepidoptera, and then of course later still the bees. Exactly when those radiations take off in the Cretaceous is, is not so uh, clear uh, to me. You know, for example, the fossil record of bees is basically a Cenozoic record uh, with I think one record from the Cretaceous with a specimen that's provenance is a little uncertain. So um, I think there's no question that the diversification of flowers through the late Cretaceous uh, reflects a response to different kinds of insect pollinators. Exactly how they're all tied in, I think is, is not immediately clear or at least not immediately clear to me. Brilliant. Um, so two questions about imaging. Uh, first of all, um, from our PhD student, student Amy, uh, who's working on Devonian plants. So she's been trying to do CT scans of um, really coalified, um, simple material without any success so far, but I'm sure she will have success. Mm -hmm. She just asked, what, what is the type of preservation you have there to get such high quality CT scans? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think the preservation is the key, obviously. And you need, um, well, obviously I showed you CT scans of two kinds, right? The flowers uh, done with the high resolution scans from Villigan, uh, they're, they're mainly charcoalified, not all charcoalified, but mainly charcoalified. And so you've got good contrast between the space in the cell that's empty and the cell wall uh, it, itself. So you get very good uh, resolution. Um, we have not yet applied that same high resolution to uh, the permineralized material, um, but at the lower CT uh, resolutions, you can isolate the organs very well um, and pretty uh, uh, pretty effectively. So I th think the the key. I think the coalified material is the hardest, and I think um, you know you really need. Uh, to have sort of contrast between the cell walls and the and the cell lumen to, to, to get high resolution, which is what we have often in our um, charcoalified material. But some of our material is lignified, it's just not very coalified, and so it's still got some structure left. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a tough one, I think. I mean, for example, I would love to be able to scan the catonia cupules but they're too coaly uh, to give much resolution, I think. Brilliant, okay. And then a question from Omar Rana. Hi, Omar. Um, he says, fascinating to see the use of imaging on these specimens. I was wondering, uh, uh, Omar is a computational scientist. I was wondering if additional computational analysis is possible, e.g. by comparing properties of plants by bringing together those different imaging outcomes into an aggregate database. This could be studied in more detail by 
comp computational algorithms, perhaps? Yeah, potentially. I mean, I think, um, uh, I mean, I think we, we, you, we're, we're using the, the images for, you know, straight anatomical uh, studies right now. Um, but I think uh, it's, it's highly likely, I mean, and these beam lines are used all the time for other analytical purposes. So, you know, someone could take off by looking at the resin bodies, for example, that are preserved in some of these things and comparing their uh, chemical composition. People have started to do that, but I'm sure that that whole area will develop much more uh, in the future. You didn't say much about cladistics, really. I mean, this is really, I mean, not using algorithms particularly, but using comparative data from different specimens to give you a way of of, of computational analysis, really. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the, um, I mean, obviously there are innumerable complicated algorithms for analyzing the molecular data. Uh, but uh, if you want to incorporate fossils, which is what, what I'm interested in doing, uh, you, you've really got morphology uh, to work with. And, the, and if you want to work with the morphology, much more important than getting the right algorithm is getting the right homologies so that you know that you're comparing apples and apples so that you, and that's why this debate about, you know, do the Benetitales have two coverings or one around the seed or are these cupules in the early Cretaceous the same as the cupules in the, in the Triassic? Those debates are kind of fundamental and it's no use doing an analysis until you figure those things out, because they will, how you figure those out will depend on the, will strongly influence the results that you get. So there's a real role for good comparative morphology and figuring out the homologies, um, rather than just skipping to the analysis. And that I think is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, I Barry, I think there's Barry Lomax there. Um, he's asked the question I wanted to ask. Um, I'm sure, I, I'm almost certain Barry's been in the same meetings as I have where people have literally shouted at each other about angiosperm origins. Um, <laughs> you didn't mention any Jurassic angiosperms at all. So uh, Barry asks, can you ask what Peter's thoughts are on the recent work that suggests a pre-Cretaceous angiosperm origin? Well, that is all based uh, pretty much based on, um, not on fossils, but on uh, extrapolations of um, rates of molecular evolution, uh, which takes us back to these complicated algorithms. So you have, you have rates of molecular evolution, you calibrate the tree, and then using algorithms of various kinds, you combine those data to give you a prediction of when these things um, arose. So the, the idea of whether there are Jurassic angiosperms really has, comes from two different directions. One is that, basically it's an extrapolation from the known fossil record based on molecular data. I have some problems with that because I think no matter how sophisticated these algorithms are, it's very difficult to account for the impacts of extinction. And I think we have a lot of diversity in some of these clades that you know, a clade today, like the water lilies, which has, I don't know, 10 genera, uh, and most of the species are concentrated in a couple of genera. In the past, that may have been many more genera with many more species. And so uh, that will have an impact on your sort of extrapolation. So that's one area, and I, I have a big question mark uh, around that. The other area, which is, which is um, I think, uh, there's less debate about uh, potentially is whether there are actually any Jurassic, any well corroborated evidence from Jurassic fossils, and I I think um, the answer to that uh, for me at the moment is no. That's not to say that there aren't some really interesting and some intriguing fossils out there. Particularly, uh, there's a, a leaf from the Middle Jurassic. It's just an impression. Uh, but it does look sort of vaguely uh, angiosperm-like. Uh, but 
it really is just an impression of one leaf. It's like one specimen. And so, you know, it's hard to, to hang your hat on that specimen. Uh, the pollen grains that have been reported are not convincing uh, to me. Uh, so uh, I think from a fossil point of view, the answer is jury's still out. No strong evidence, pre-Cretaceous. Um, and then the, the other line of argument, which is based on the uh, extrapolations based on molecular data, I, I, have, I think there are still some really severe theoretical problems with those approaches. Excellent. Um, so uh, the last question we have at the moment, it, it's not really a question, it's really a comment from Margaret, uh, just saying thank you and that she's um, very interested in the, the time zones um, that you've been talking about. Uh, and um, however, they didn't really talk about stratigraphy when it came to plants. And she's, uh, she's, she's grateful for hearing um, some stratigraphy of, of plant fossils. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Margaret, for, for being with us. Um, Diane, that's all the questions, I think. John, can you confirm? We haven't missed any of the questions out, have we? Um, just to double check, um, Patricia Gensel had one about choristosperm. Yeah, we did that right at the beginning. Covered that, okay. Yeah. Excuse my pronunciation. <laughs> yeah. It's lovely to hear from Pat, who's in North Carolina. Yeah. So not far. No. Mm. Close. Okay. Well, I, it, it just requires my thanking you for a very stimulating and beautifully illustrated lecture. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're agreeable. We're agreed on the fact that small is beautiful. <laughs> well, I think I have to give in and think that perhaps your fossils are more beautiful than my fossils. Mm -hmm. So you certainly win on that one. But I think we might be in agreement too that my plants and your plants are the two groups that really change the face of our planet. Mm -hmm. uh, mine to the, the beginnings, yours uh, to the, the sort of world that we live in today. So thank you so much for a stim very stimulating talk. Now, I wish I could announce what's going to happen next month. Uh, I, can, I can tell you that uh, uh, Jane, Jane Francis, who is the director of the British, uh, British Antarctic Survey, yes. is going to talk about from greenhouse to ice house, forests and dinosaur fossils amid ice sheets at the South Pole. She actually is presently in this country, but has been to a conference in Iceland because she can't, doesn't want to get away from the, from the, uh, the cold bits. Um, at the moment, we haven't decided whether it would be by Zoom or by face-to-face. -face. It would be lovely if we could welcome Jane here. Um, we'll see what, how it goes and how the Welsh attitude to all the restrictions that we have changed uh, over this period. So please, would you keep an eye on our websites? And um, I'd like to thank those of you who have joined us um, distantly. Uh, I hope that we picked up a few more people who might come in um, on the second Tuesday of the month um, and uh, enjoy uh, learning, well, for me, quite a lot outside my, my research field, even though I'm a paleobotanist. So thank you very much indeed, Peter. And may I just wish all of you a very happy, healthy, and completely non-eventual <laughs> 2022. Thank you yeah. for joining us. Thank you. And thank you, John. 